Welcome to the History of South Africa series with me, your host, Des Latham. My History of South Africa podcast has more than 1.3 million listens as of this recording, and now I'm introducing the YouTube series. Please hit the like and subscribe button below and head off to my site desmondlatham.blog after this for more information about donations and support. Welcome to the History of South Africa podcast with me, your host, Des Latham. This is episode one of what is going to be a fairly lengthy series, which could extend over more than three years as we burrow deeply into a truly unique part of planet Earth. Each podcast will take around 20 minutes, and at times I'll be drawing on guests to provide expertise. Just a note of thanks to one of the most unique and informed people I've ever met, apart from my wife, of course. Through the academic year of 2000 and 2001, I was fortunate to attend a series of lectures at Harvard University, delivered by the remarkable Professor John Stilgo, who is the Robert and Lois Orchard Professor at the History of Landscape Development. His understanding of historical connections through a broad array of sources and his factual presentation was life-changing. I dedicate this series to John Stilgo. Thank you, John, for those two-hour lectures that kept me enthralled with your sophisticated, idiosyncratic presentation style. So, to the topic. In this episode, we'll begin with prehistory, where we understand that humans are merely a recent layer of mammal on top of ancient rocky outcrops. Parts of South Africa feature some of the oldest rocks you will find anywhere on planet Earth. In what is now the Mpumalanga province near Barberton, for example, strange-looking bumps peer out from the bottom of the famous escarpment, and if you strike these rocks a lusty blow with your trusty geological hammer, you'll chip off bits of 3.5 billion year old sedimentary rock known as the Barberton Greenstone Belt, and that was formed during the Archaean Age. Rocks which solidified from one of the earliest cycles of volcanic activity were tinged green by the chlorites and are known as greenstone. They are also tinged in economically important metals, gold in particular. Diamonds are another product of the ancient rocks, although further away from Barberton in the west of South Africa. Diamonds form at temperatures of 1,000 to 1,500 degrees centigrade and at pressures exerted by about 150 kilometers of overlying rock. And gold requires the extraordinary hydrothermal superheated water which is under immense pressure. Incredible chemistry takes place where water then transports dissolved substances which are not normally soluble through other matter without mixing, then deposits these as concentrated veins of ore in the cracks of solidifying rocks over many millions of years. The simple fact, as historian John Reeder notes, is that the oldest rocks bequeath the greatest wealth, and southern Africa is especially well endowed. 2.8 billion years ago, the Carpfile gold was entrapped in greenstone strata of mountains ranged in an arc around the northern shores of a vast lake which extended about 600 kilometers west of modern Johannesburg and about 250 kilometers across. This was what became known as the Witwatersrand Basin, and over the next 500 million years, it filled with sediments eroded from the northern mountains, including gold from the greenstone strata. These sediments eventually accumulated to a depth of 7 kilometers. The Witwatersrand gold is wealth enough but geology contrived to deposit even greater riches within the boundaries of South Africa. Just over the northern rim of the Witwatersrand Basin, a huge single mass of rock lies beneath the land surface. It's a geological feature that is unmatched anywhere else on Earth, the repository of unparalleled mineral wealth, and it's called the Bushveld Igneous Complex. Two billion years ago, Volcanic spasms squeezed magma through the crust and laid it down, an island of solid rock 400 kilometers long and 10 kilometers thick. It was one piece. This is crucial to understand what treasures it contains and have been tapped by Africans and then Europeans. The Bushveld Igneous Complex is roughly the same size as Sri Lanka, 66,000 square kilometers, but its shape is like a four-leaf clover, with the stem pointing towards where Pretoria is today, and the rock is a single homogeneous unit. The same rocks are found throughout its 400 kilometers, 
and its singularity and age is what gives the Bushveld igneous complex its huge value. Let's consider why. This extraordinary subterranean island of rock is one of only 19 of its type known around the world. Nine are in Africa, five in North America, three in Scotland, one each in Greenland and Antarctica. However, the Bushveld igneous complex is twice as large as all the others put together. That's a lot of value in one place and would have a constant impact on humans who drifted over its surface for these thousands of years. The area is one of the world's treasure houses, producing gold, chrome, copper, nickel, tin, iron, fluor spar, vanadium and platinum. The reserves of various metals exceed 3 billion tons, enough to support more than a thousand years of mining. And in modern historical terms, this has meant African labour toiling underground to extract value for a mainly European investor. This massive rock has made its mark on the social landscape, so to speak. This has also had an effect on South African politics, and all because of the Bushveld igneous complex. The social and physical landscapes are linked, and human societies act out their dramas on the surface of geology. We'll come back to this theme throughout the series. But the forces that created the Bushveld igneous complex had other effects. The dome eventually collapsed under the pressure and weight, so the southern edge saw the beds of rock being bent until they snapped like slabs of peanut brittle. This created edges of steep jagged cliffs on the south side and a steady incline on the north. The jagged edges of the quartzite beds that fractured two billion years ago are now the rounded humps and ridges of the Michalisberg mountain range which stretch for more than 300 kilometers from east to west on the southern tip of this Bushveld complex. This has had ecological and historical consequences which resonate down the eons to this day. For example, the northern slopes receive direct sunshine and less rainfall than the steeper southern slopes, making the north hotter and drier. Vegetation is sparse to the north, more lush on the south. So what has happened over time is that the higher ground of the cooler sides of these hills are properties that are more expensive to buy. Wealthy citizens are scattered along this ridge, while black citizens of Pretoria's townships live on the north-facing humps and ridges. The Makarisberg Mountains were used strategically in various conflicts and wars. For example, Mzilikatsi of the Ndebele took up residence among the mountains when he fled from Shaka, and later the Boers hid some of their cattle and commandos from the British during the Anglo-Boer War. A large dam lies on the south side of one of these high ridges these days, and it's called the Hot Bispoot Dam. And at the dam wall, you'll find the ecological boundary to the north lie the Springbok Flats, because these animals could thrive in a dry environment, thus the name. The hot beast, a type of buck, preferred the south side with its leafy greens. These days, well-off residents of Johannesburg and Pretoria like it too, and have built golf courses and townhouse complexes on the south side. Not far from here lies another treasure trove. Near Rustenburg, there's something called the Marensky Reef, a vast unit of the Bushveld igneous complex with about half of the reef untouched even today. And that reef is about as thick as a six-story building is high, and within this geological feature is the world's greatest reserves of platinum group metals. Platinum makes up 59%, palladium 25%, and rare metals like ruthenium, rhodium, iridium, and osmium accounting for the rest. There's also gold, nickel, copper, and cobalt. And just to top off the Marensky Reef's remarkable value, it has an extensive layer of chrome ore. If you've ever driven past the surplus production stockpiles of this area, you'll notice the surface sparkles like silver. That's the chrome. So let's take a quick look at the climate. When global temperatures fell abruptly between 7 and 5 million years ago, the Antarctic ice cap was established, leading to a powerful current of cold, upwelling water that flowed along the west coast of southern Africa. That current is called the Benguela, and brought intensely arid conditions to the dry southwest coast. Temperatures rose for some time, then fell about 3 million years ago, which caused even more arid conditions. 
This topsy-turvy record changed vegetation and the way in which earliest hominids or pre-humans lived. The landscape opened up and dense equatorial-type forests were transformed into a mosaic of smaller forests dotted across the southern African savanna. Woodland and grasses emerged. This period, up to the present, has experienced quite an interesting phenomenon. That is, these arid and wet cycles have evolved into rhythmic patterns that last tens of thousands of years at a time, and each effect is generally gradual. Animals evolved along with human ancestors over this period. About 2.5 million years ago, a heavily built hominid appears in the fossil record. First discovered around Lake Tucana in the Rift Valley, Australopithecus's fossils were eventually found in sites all the way from Ethiopia to South Africa. But they died out about a million years ago, and in their place, a far more graceful hominid emerged, one that developed tools and therefore had developed intelligence. Homo erectus, because it walked more smoothly and upright. These precursors to humans were napping stones, that is, working them into sharp edges by hitting them with other stones. The earliest known tools were found in Ethiopia and East Africa from around 2.4 million years ago. Essentially, stone tools enable hominids to do with their hands what animals did with their teeth and claws. This, say scientists, led to another trait of animal intelligence, organized hunting in groups. Eventually, Homo erectus sustained and their bones have been found across South Africa, Tanzania, Kenya and Ethiopia, as well as Morocco and Algeria. Interestingly, they also emerged in Java, China and Europe. They were the likely ancestors of the Neanderthals. By a million years ago, the brain of Homo erectus measured 1,000 cc's, which is on the edge of modern human range of 1,000 to 2,000 cc's. They were the longest surviving and most widely dispersed of all our ancestral toolmakers. But their species began disappearing 200,000 years ago, taking their characteristic hand axes with them. Homo sapiens then replaced Homo erectus. We know Homo sapiens was different because instead of the crude, although sharp, hand axes came tools like small flakes, scrapers, and thinner blades in the archaeological record. That was a technological leap. By about 130,000 years ago, Homo sapiens tools such as long narrow blades indicated a form of technological know-how unseen before. Their brains were almost 1,700 cc's in size. Modern humans were on the landscape. Fine slivers of stone were used to pierce skins. Single-edged blades were napped to use for cutting and sawing. An entire toolkit emerged. Animals became both a source of food and clothing. Gum was chewed for glue. Bark was stripped from the trees to use as rope. And by 130,000 years ago, Homo sapiens sapiens was born. The oldest known fossil evidence of their existence has come from the caves and mountains of Zululand, cliff shelters on the Indian Ocean shoreline of South Africa, and the savanna environments of the Rift Valley. Crucially, all other sapiens sapien fossil evidence from Europe, Middle East, China, Borneo, and Australia are much younger. We now know from DNA evidence that Africa is the home of all humans, and southern Africans, such as the San, have the most DNA diversity. Of course, when the first European descendants of the Sapien Sapien migrants landed on African shores in the 15th century, there was no sense of returning home. They were as alien to the Africans as Africans were to them. Now, language is as old as humanity, and just as geneticists have confirmed African origin of all people, linguists have shown that the most ancient surviving languages are all from Africa. One of these is a conjoined language called Khoisan, spoken by the Kongsan Bushmen. The others are Nijo Congo, or Bantu languages, the Nilo Saharan, which are the Maasai and other pastoral types, and Afro Asiatic, which are Ethiopian and North African. So, yeah. In South Africa, we speak versions of two of the most ancient languages on earth. And even more extraordinary, to speak San or Khoikhoi from a phonetic point of view is to speak the world's most complex language. To speak it fluently means we exploit our phonetic ability to the full. There is no other language on earth that has the phonetic complexity. Extrapolating the data, scientists were able to map ancient migrations of populations 
and determined that the exit point of modern humans out of Africa was near the middle of the Red Sea in East Africa. Just to be clear about this, 100,000 years ago, everybody was a hunter-gatherer like the Khoisan, and it's generally believed that language evolved among our ancestors because effective communication enhances food gathering. No one knows when, of course. Another crucial fact is the size at which hunter-gatherer societies function most effectively, and we know what it is. It's around 148 people. Tiny bands of 10 or much larger groups in the hundreds cannot function properly over time as hunter-gatherers. There's just not enough food and tension within the group breaks it up. Be aware, folks, this series won't necessarily be restricted by modern borders on our maps. These are just artificial things that humans ignore. The subcontinent extends the reach of humans both across the land and the sea, so we will have to track the past with an eye on what I suppose is more like a satellite image than an old-fashioned Cartesian map. I'll explain how the Kalahari used to extend to Kinshasa on the Congo River, for example, and also the effect of Arab, Indian, Chinese, Phoenician and European trading, as we're going to understand the diverse migrations that characterized Africa for tens of thousands of years continue. These migrations have a Southern African connection. So the history of South Africa. The past is with us every day of our lives, but most people have no idea how closely allied we are to this legacy. At times, Africans controlled settlers. At other times, British, Dutch and even French administrations rejected white colonials and their politics. So our history is tens of thousands of years old. Our ancients more ancient than the original settlers of Europe 70,000 years ago. And our human DNA here in southern Africa, the most diverse on earth. As I sit writing this, the cradle of humankind is a mere 45 minutes drive away, where archaeologists have discovered pre-human treasures. Walking through the cradle of humankind limestone caves into which a tiny hominid plunged millions of years ago and whose bones were found in the first half of the 20th century really does put things into perspective. The caves on our southeast coast have middens going back tens of thousands of years before modern humans departed from Africa when we strode into the Middle East and Europe, Southeast Asia, Australasia and ultimately sailed to the Pacific Islands. In this series... We'll hear stories about the British, the Boers, the Zulu, the Sutu, the Tkosa, the San, the Khoikhoi, the Portuguese, the Dutch, Indians, Chinese, Americans, Shona, Rolong, Fokeng, Swazi, Indibeli, Venda, Tsonga, Mtetwa, Ndwandwe, Tlubi, Kwabe, Mfengu, and even the Phoenicians, amongst others. You'll hear amazing facts in this series. For example, a thousand years ago, large cities of up to 15,000 people or more could be found on the Haarfeld of South Africa. Later, the Baralong at Ditokong had a town teeming with around 20,000 people in the first half of the 1800s, surrounded by cattle stations where more than 330,000 beasts were raised. Meanwhile, Cape Town at that point was a small town with a population of less than 2,000 who could only survive with a direct link to Europe, providing settlers with iron implements, clothing, coffee and tea and sugar. The Baralong were powerful partly because they controlled much of the trade in ivory, precious metals and hides to Delagoa Bay and Safara on the Indian Ocean east coast. Those were the trade routes that were part of a massive international trading network. Chinese traders were plying the Indian Ocean along with Arabs at least a thousand years before Europeans arrived in southern Africa and their goods were found far inland by 1050 AD. Some found their way to modern-day central Botswana. This is heady stuff. By the way, if there's anyone listening who thinks this is all just supposition, archaeology and science is behind the analysis. There's also evidence the Phoenicians stopped off at Safala and as far south as Beira with both oral tradition and cultural artifacts linking the great seafarers of modern-day Lebanon to our region at least 500 BC. Think about that! It was a time of Carthage, for goodness sake. We now know that the San and Khoikhoi peoples predated the Nguni and Sutu in South Africa. They may have been brown-skinned or yellow, as early explorers described, but they were not black in the modern sense. In the case of the San, they predate the Bantu speakers by at least 100,000 years, Khoikhoi at least 8,000 years. So how did the Khoikhoi and San relate to each other before the Nguni and Sutu popped up? on the archaeological record. As with all things complex, 
Sometimes they got along, sometimes they didn't. It is very important to stress that the Sutu and Nguni people did not arrive together in southern Africa, which is another misconception. The evidence is overwhelming in this case, with the Sutu arriving hundreds of years before the ancestors of modern-day Zulu at Koza. This has created quite a bit of historical revisionism over time, particularly by post-colonial historians. In some cases, the descendants of these early migrating Bantu people actually turned around and migrated back northwards, some ending up in modern-day Malawi after starting their journey from the KwaZulu-Natal region, for example. How about that? The perception, of course, is that the Nguni peoples came from the north and only moved south, eventually bumping into Europeans who themselves were moving north in Africa and came from the south. Partly true, partly false, but there's more to that story, as you will hear. Then, of course, the Boer trekkers. Some of these traveled from the Cape and later in history ended up at a place called El Doret in Kenya. Their descendants are now black. Fascinating. It's time now to call a halt to the musings about DNA, geology and geography. Next episode, we'll look at the landscape, the climate, the soils and start painting the picture of early humans who emerged on this sub-Saharan canvas. If you want to contact me, please head off to desmondlatham.blog where there's a link on the site or you can direct message me on Twitter at Des Latham. Next week, we'll also hear about climatic changes and some of the amazing innovations that developed in Southern Africa. Thanks for listening. I'm launching a Patreon account soon. And don't forget to head off to my site, desmondlatham.blog, where you can contact me. And of course, please like and subscribe to this series. It's going to be epic, just like South African history. Until next, goodbye.